Peggy McCowan from the Contemporary American Theater Festival. Peggy, good morning. How are you feeling today? Any any problems with fumes or vapors in your life? <laughs> good morning. I appreciate that uh, information about the difference. So thank you. <laughs> yeah, I'm, I'm still not sure I understand, but you know, I'm going with it for now. It, I think it's very good. I appreciate the fact that we're being very specific about those things too. Yeah. Uh, John, you you are you have tickets to go see the first play uh, when? Um, I'm going to see all of them, and I start my run on Saturday. What are you seeing first? I don't have it in front of me. It's the two-parter. It's the one that... Um, right. What will happen to all that beauty? Yes. Right. Yes. Mm -hmm. What will happen to all that beauty? We had, we had uh, <clears throat> Camille set us up with uh, Kenneth Tiger about, uh -huh. a, about a week and a half ago, and he was just amazing, by the way. I, I'll, be watching, the, I'll be watching yes. his on Thursday. Thursday you're yeah. going to see his one-man yes, show? Yeah. 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 Good. He is great. He's sort of the classic actor. Uh, he, he just he can do it all. He's really terrific in the show. Oh yeah, his his TV and film credits are extensive. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And he's, yes. he's a wonderful gentleman too. Yes, he really is. He's a good company member as well. Yeah. So uh, what's the buzz heading into this? Uh, you had your opening uh, week already, but, uh, July mm -hmm. 5. What kind of turnout did you get, Peggy? We had a really nice turnout. It definitely was uh, numbers. We're definitely improving our numbers, you know, post-pandemic, which is important to us. And uh, people coming back, I had a couple that came up to me and said, you know, we haven't been here for five years. But we're back, and we're excited to be back. And so that's really encouraging to know that people are willing to come out again and sort of coming over that pandemic hump, if you will. So the plays that was are, exciting. What will yeah. happen to all that beauty? Enough to let the light in. Tornado tastes like aluminum sting. The happiest man on earth. And the bonus event, A Mother's Voice, which will run July 20, 21, and 23. But taking that one out... Did one of the four or a couple of the four seem to be more heavily attended this uh, opening weekend, Peggy? No, it was pretty interesting this weekend that it was very even in terms of attendance. And we had really full houses and everything. So that was really good. And one of the things that I was most encouraged about is that people really appreciated the variety of experiences because all the shows are really different and so i think people felt like they were coming to see you know step like a whole season of somebody else's show just in a couple of days and i think there was a real appreciation for the variety of voices that we have this year do most people's uh, do most people see all four plays um it, you know that's sort of an interesting question right now <laughs> so before the pandemic absolutely people would see all the shows now they're maybe they see half of them or sometimes three of them and the other challenge that we face right now is the lodging situation right so people come and stay a little uh, less time than they did before so it's not quite the way it was we're seeing more single tickets than we had seen before, but I would say that the majority of people still see them all. Is this behavior something that a lot of playhouses around the country are going through right now? A lot of stages experiencing the same thing that you're describing, Peggy? Yes. People have been talking about subscribers to a season really declining. And I think even that idea was happening prior to the pandemic and I think part of that is that people don't want to commit months and months and months in advance to a schedule of activities. And so they're buying individual packages or smaller packages closer to the time of the event. And so that's kind of a trend that we're seeing in everything, even music concerts, all sorts of things. That's interesting because so much of the spending now is event spending as opposed to purchasing goods, something that you can hold in your hand and, and, and own or whatever. So this is mm -hmm. kind of fascinating how this little carve out is working. Do you still attribute it to COVID type uh, behavior? Uh, I don't, I don't know. I think because 
as I said, a lot of that we were seeing as a trend prior to the pandemic. I think some of it could be attributed to the fact that we have access to so much online now that people are making that decision about whether they want to stay home and see something and do something or whether they want to go out and do something. And I think it's more spontaneous. I just think it happens um, more in the moment. Are there any online streams where you can watch these plays? Not yet. <laughs> I like well, that laugh. I know you're having an impact. We, My wife and I went to uh, dinner on Saturday night down in Shepherdstown at the press room. And we got there, I don't know, about 6.15 or so and, and couldn't get a table. There, it was place was jam-packed. Sorry, it's completely full. So we finally found a, a place at the bar we could sit and, and have somebody eat and and then come, I don't know, 7 o'clock, a little before 7, empty, just completely yeah. empty. And I said, I asked the bartender, what happened? Said, oh, that's CATF. Come whatever, 8, 30, 9 o'clock, we'll be full again. So it's, uh -huh. you're, you're, having, you're having that impact when, when you can see the difference in how the restaurants and bars are attended. That's, that's good. Yes. That, that's a lot of people. Well, it's interesting. You know, the press room is actually one of those restaurants that calls us early to get the schedule so that they can sort of craft different kinds of menus that they know they can get people in and out quickly so that they sort of are on the clock of the schedule to play. So that, it's amazing how helpful and supportive that our local businesses are in sort of keeping people um, fed and going to the theater. Billy. Yeah, uh, good morning, Peggy. Uh, does the venue change uh, through the uh, through the course of the events? In other words, does happiest man on earth always appear at the Opera House or be at the Frank Center or, or what? Uh, the happiest man on earth will always be at the Opera House. So okay. we won't change any of that because it's too difficult to pick up all the physical aspects of a production and move them around unless we're really in that rep cycle, which we're not in this year. So. How about the others? Will the others stay at their uh, at one particular venue? Yes. Okay. Yes. Mm -hmm. So I was in preparing for the show. I, I'm reading some stuff, interviews that you did mostly last year, actually, and for the Frederick News Post. Um, one of the questions you you answered, you know, I, I'm a writer, and one of the um, questions you answered dealt with escapism. Uh, somebody. I guess your predecessor would avoid anything that smacks of escapism. And your answer uh, included, well, this isn't escapism. And, it's, and I'm curious, what's wrong with escapism? What, what was the, what's the, what is that? Mm -hmm. And why is that a bad thing? Well, I don't think it's a bad thing. So if I applaud that it was, I didn't mean that. I don't think it's a bad thing. I just don't think it's necessarily uh, what, we as an institution, as a, a theater, are dedicated to. But it also depends on how you define escapism. So some people think escapism is an opportunity to step out of your current life and be somewhere else on an experience that feels totally different. And I actually do think when you're in the theater and you're engrossed in that, you're probably in that, right? But there is also an association with that that's that it removes us from any of the discomfort or uh, sort of challenges that we're also facing. And I know that some of the plays that we produce um, still make people feel that sense of discomfort, and sometimes it is very provocative. And so it just depends on how you define it. I wouldn't say it's a bad thing. I would just say that for us at CATF, we hope to provide a really profound experience that does take you away, but it may not eliminate some of that discomfort or challenging sort of thought-provoking time. So a modern equivalent of a Neil Simon comedy uh, today would, is not, it would not be a CATF uh, candidate? Uh, pro probably not. <laughs> um, unless... You know, I do look for comedies that I think are really humorous and fun and will take people on a certain journey, but will also have a profound statement within them. And uh, that's a very challenging thing to find, mm -hmm. you know. 
Do you make these I, decisions? Now, if Neil Simon had handed me a play, I, I probably would have still considered it. <laughs> <laughs> all right. He was Neil Simon after all. Yeah. Peggy, yeah. do you make these decisions pretty much on your own? I do. Um, I do have a team of people that work with uh, CATF that help us sort of craft the final season. But getting to that shorter list of plays right now is largely my responsibility. Do you already have your short list for 2025 and maybe part of your short list for, for 2026 selected? <laughs> oh, I wish I did. <laughs> um, I have at least a couple of things that I feel like, oh, this would be really right for 25. And I have one thing that I'm really developing for 26. We're working on a musical that I hope will be in our 26th season. So I have a few things, but I don't have the whole season. Have yeah. you guys done a musical before? We have done a few musicals, a few. <laughs> so this will be big for us. Doesn't that vastly complicate your life? I mean, not only finding actors, but musicians, actors who can sing and dance, plus musicians who can back them up. It does. But, you know, we are in a community that has an extraordinary group of musicians, right? So being able to hire local musicians, it makes it more possible. Also, this musical is actually uh, set on the Appalachian Trail. And uh, so it feels really right for the community of artists that we have. Uh, Peggy, you have four plays this time. In years past, you've had five. Uh, now, if you consider a mother's voice, you have five this year. But uh, is this uh, reducing from five to four uh, something was planned, and will that continue, or what? It was definitely planned in part because what will happen to all that beauty is a very long play, and so we've broken it into two parts. And because of that, it almost fits into our schedule uh, as, a, as five plays. And so one of the things we have to do is sort of manage people's time, whether they're the artists working on the shows or the audience actually coming. And so that it was a very conscious choice as we were looking about the schedule. Um, but one of the things we're really trying to do is figure out a way to create a more manageable workload for our, our artists, but also a more manageable experience for the audience so that they have downtime to process, they have downtime to be in the community and be in the businesses, that they have an opportunity to explore everything else that's in the Eastern Panhandle. So we're really trying to figure out how to strike that balance between really good theater and a good overall destination experience. You mentioned something about a lodging, <clears throat> excuse me, a lodging issue. How many people have we imported from out of town that are, that are, that have to be here for the duration between um, actors and technicians and what have you. And how many of them stay in the dorms at Shepherd? Well, we have 135 people here. We have directors and designers, and uh, those folks leave after opening. So about 40 people are leaving us right now. So that probably leaves about actually 100 and what 10 maybe. Um, people that are still in town now that group of people that just left were largely in airbnbs throughout the community and the rest of the company is on the shepherd campus in either the suites or the apartments on campus what's the depth chart like for the plays does everybody have a backup of some sort in case somebody gets sick or something happens no, they don't. You just said that <laughs> out loud. No, Man. I just put that out there. <laughs> <laughs> okay, that brings up all kind of fun options and opportunities, then, doesn't it? I, I'll be calling you all. If something happens to Kenneth Tiger, I'll be like, you got to go on. Well, if you're doing a musical, Gilstrap's who you want to start with because he used to sing when he was in college. Used and, to is the operative and phrase he's been there, on Rob. many. He's been on many TV shows, too. Uh, a few. Yeah, but, Excellent. Um, yeah, he's been used to. Show. I was much younger. I, I had hair. That, tell, that gives you an idea how long ago that was. Yeah. Still, it's intriguing. Has anybody ever auditioned right off the campus at Shepherd, gotten a part, and then gone on to do bigger and, uh, and even uh, more famous things? Um, there have been some students that have been through that are, now have pretty successful careers in the industry. They're not necessarily famous, but mm -hmm. they're definitely working all the time as actors or 
um, we have some folks who are stage managers. And so we definitely are seeing people continue to have careers. By the time these plays come to town, is the cast already set? Yes. Yeah, going back to the question you asked before, uh, this past uh, a couple so months ago, the music department Shepherd brought an alumni at that were part of a kind of a mega performance. It was very impressive, and a lot of folks have done, as Peggy said, not headliners, but are playing significant roles in a wide variety of, of stage opportunities. Yeah, if, you, if you're making a living doing it, yeah. that's an accomplishment. It's not easy to do mm-hmm. that, right? Yes. Yeah. Yes, Peggy. Let's run down the plays again, and chance to promote them because you're going to you're going to run this uh, all the way through pretty much most of the month of July. I think it doesn't uh, stop till July 28. Correct? That's correct. All right. Mm-hmm. Let, let's let's rock our way through the plays that you're presenting at the CATF, and let's let's start first. Which one are you seeing first, John? What? Um, the beauty. What will happen to all that beauty? Give us the two minute uh, summary. Okay. Of it. Uh, this is a story about family and legacy and how the AIDS epidemic and HIV have impacted that uh, family. And it is, contrary to what it sounds like, it is a beautiful, poetic, loving, uh, humorous journey that is filled to the brim with really amazing talent and experiences. There, really went well yesterday. Any actors or actresses in this play that we would recognize? Um, there are some folks. So uh, one of the actors in it is has originated several roles in August Wilson plays and is all over TV a lot now. And so I think people might recognize him. It's, you might recognize several people because there are a lot of people who do TV in that show. Cool. Enough to let the light in. The story of two women in love who are having an evening together where they are learning all sorts of truths about each other. And then other things begin to happen around them that question whether they can really continue in this relationship and what they will do really to save the love that they have for one another. But it's really a psychological thriller, jump scares, if you jump like scares. that kind of genre. Cool. Tornado tastes like aluminum sting. First and foremost, what does that title mean? (laughs) So this is a play written by an autistic playwright who has synesthesia. And synesthesia is when you experience uh, sometimes all of your senses receiving information at the same time and or different kinds of processing of that sensory experience. So, for example, a tornado may... um, sort of ignite a response in your senses that it tastes like something. Uh, And so this play is about an autistic teenager who wants to be a filmmaker, and we learn how that process of growing and living within a family and being autistic is challenging and loving and beautiful, and uh, it really introduces you to the idea of a different, the neurodivergent process of thinking. The Happiest Man on Earth. Story of a Holocaust survivor. This is based on uh, Eddie Jacu's novel. And I shouldn't call it a novel, on his book. And uh, the play is moving and amazing, harrowing experiences are shared. But it is also very uplifting and very much about how we love one another as human beings. And uh, the bonus event in collaboration with Music Ireland and the Appalachian Chamber Music Festival, A Mother's Voice, July 20, 21, and 23. Right. So this is a joint project with the uh, musicians, and it is really an art installation of sorts. And so the principle of it is about the mother's homes in Ireland, when mothers who were pregnant, who were unmarried, were put into these homes and Sometimes even their children were taken away from them. So it's very profound, but the music is extraordinary. And so um, I really encourage music lovers to come as well. Is this a full-length production? It's about 30 minutes in performance, and then there will be a discussion with Music Ireland afterwards. So I think the whole experience will be around an hour. 
is it fair to say if if there's an MPAA rating for these plays, we're we're looking at the PG thirteen R category for most of them. Uh, most of them. Okay, <laughs> that's fair. Peggy, I love your laugh. <laughs> I also we got I, we got a couple minutes left here. When I was doing the the research, you're an, a costume designer as well, aren't you? Yes, yes, I am. <laughs> and you you have designed costumes in the past for CATF productions. I I actually designed one this year too. Okay. Oh, who's? Uh, enough to let the light in. Oh, okay. Very nice. Go ahead, John. I was just going to say how important. Obviously, costumes are important to a play, but. How important to a play are they? And I guess I, that could be a whole half hour segment. I guess. But, but, but you only have one minute. We only have one minute. Yeah. Okay. Well, you know, they are the character that you create. So in addition to the work of the actor, the costume designer is creating that character you meet on stage. Okay, that was well less than a minute. That was <laughs> good, good economy on that one. Yeah. But here's what I want to share with you. I may be the only costume designer in the country that is also an artistic director. All right. So and kind of the managing director, too, right? Right now, yes. Yeah. <laughs> right now has been for like the last four years, hasn't it, Peggy? Yes. Well, let's hope there's a change. <laughs> <laughs> Peggy, uh, go ahead and tell everybody how they can get tickets to the plays uh, all month long here. Please uh, go to our website, catf.org, and you can buy online or you could call the box office from there. Peggy, you have the best laugh in show business. Great stuff. <laughs> Thank you. You're quite welcome. Have a great day. Thank you all. I appreciate it. Take care. Can't wait to see the plays. Best of luck, Peggy. Mm -hmm. Bye. Peggy McCowan. She needs <laughs>